Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd the Shore. I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and woke up in a strange room seemingly on a ship and we made our way out before the water was able to completely drown us in there. The first escape room was a bit uh, rough with the with tons of tutorials, but now that we're actually starting to get with more story-focused moments, we're going to really see why I love this game. So, without further ado, let's get into episode 2. Junpei leapt up the stairs, straight for the door. The door burst open, and Junpei exploded out of it, only to freeze in his tracks. What other possible response could there have been to what he saw? What, what the hell? His voice trailed off, and all he could do was stare. A polished floor stretched out before him, ornate staircases rising up from the edges, each one of them equidistant from the others. The stairs and pillars were solid wood, and Art Nouveau embellishments and decorations covered the walls and pillars. It looked like nothing so much as the entrance to a luxurious mansion from the early 1900s. Junpei couldn't help but wonder, was he really in a ship? The water quickly filling the hallway behind him suggested that, yes, he was. As he looked, a fresh wave rolled out of the room that he'd been in, gathering speed as it moved toward the stairs. Yeah, that's what I thought. This is totally a boat. Wait, what the hell? A wave? Sh shit, I gotta get out of here! Junpei spun around, his wet shoes squeaking in protest on the polished floor, and ran toward the tremendous staircase in front of him. Sea deck. B deck. As he ran, he glanced quickly at the plates mounted on the wall, denoting the decks of the ship. He took the stairs two at a time, not entirely sure where he would find himself, just as he began to wonder where, in fact, the stairs did lead. Junpei saw another person out of the corner of his eye. He stopped short, nearly tripping over the next stair, and looked. It wasn't just one person he'd seen. On the landing to the left of the stairs, there were four people staring at him. And on the right side, three more. All told, there were seven of them. It looked as though they had been on their way down the stairs. They'd stopped short when they saw Junpei, their eyes wide. He'd done the same, of course, and now they stood there staring at one another. Junpei didn't move, one foot placed awkwardly on the next step in the middle of a stride. Who were these people? This entire interaction lasted only a matter of seconds. The woman spoke to Junpei, and time began to move again. I guess there's another one of us now. The woman's dress, Junpei thought, rather like a dancer. Her clothes covered her very little, and her prodigious jewelry little more. Hey, you, come on, hurry! No further ceremony, she ran straight past Junpei and toward the doors behind him. The sudden proximity of a woman with such striking assets left Junpei momentarily stunned. But the other wasted no time, as quickly followed as, and quickly followed the strange woman. The first to pass Junpei was a young man with silver hair. He threw a quick glance in Junpei's direction as he ran, muttering, <laughs> One of us, huh? Following him was an older man, his face calm and without fear. Soft wrinkles sprouted from his eyes, and he quickly came close, close enough as he passed for Junpei to see wisps of gray, gray in his hair. His composure and shock of hair struck Junpei as rather like that of an elderly lion. Going up won't do you any good. There are two doors, but neither of them will open. Next to speak was a girl with pink hair and a high voice. Come on! Aren't you coming? You gotta hurry! Her small hand was wrapped around the wrist of another man. His eyes were closed, almost as though he were sleeping. His features were graceful, almost serene, and he was dressed rather elegantly for someone of his age. Something about his posture seemed very refined, and Jimbei couldn't help the feeling he was noble and dignified somehow. He'd certainly never seen one, but this man seemed like what Junpei had always imagined a prince would be like. That's nine of us, then. All of the cards are in hand. What does all of the cards are in hand mean, he wondered. Junpei opened his mouth to ask what the other man had meant, but the girl with pink hair rushed past him, and they were gone. He turned just in time to see two more people running toward him. One of them had hair like a bird's nest and looked as though he were, and looked as though a stiff breeze might topple him. And the other was a ver veritable mountain of a man. The scrawny one said nothing and scuttled past Junpei as though he were running from something. Hey, what the hell are you standing there for? Did you hear him? The doors on A deck are no good. We gotta check the doors on B deck. Got it? Now go! Before he had a chance to respond, the man laid a massive hand on Junpei's shoulder. With no more effort than Junpei would have used to brush aside a fly, the man shoved him out of the way. 
Whoa! Thrown off balance by the man and recent events, it took Junpei a few steps to get his bearings. He finally regained his balance and looked up at what the other seven had been running toward. There were two pairs of large iron doors set into the wall in front of him. They looked quite sturdy, and each had handles jutting from them. Written across the surface of each door in red paint was a number. The door on the right had a four, and the door on the left had a five. They're the same. The guy Junpei decided to call Silver was mumbling to himself. The room I woke up in had a number on the door just like that. You too, eh? Hey? With an arched eyebrow, the lion looked over at Silver. My cell was the same, a number upon the door. I opened it, ran out the hallway outside, and found myself in a rather grand room full of stairs, as I suspect did the rest of you. It was as though the floodgates had been opened. They all began to talk at once. Me too. I did too. Yeah, door with a number on it. It soon became clear that each one of them had awoken in a number with a locked door and solved a puzzle to escape. They all ended up in the same room. Almost as though they'd been guided there. Yes, we all saw the same thing. That's not important. We need to hurry. You don't think I know that, lady? Before the dancer had time to finish, Silver was already running. He grabbed hold of the door labeled 5 and pulled. However... Fuck! It's not opening! This damn thing won't even budge! Move! You're in the way! The mountain grabbed Silver's shoulders and tossed him aside. His path cleared, he took a few steps back and threw himself at the door. Once. Twice. Three times. Four times. The door shook as his body slammed into it, but showed no signs of breaking or opening. The mountain threw himself at the door again. Junpei turned toward the door four. Next to the door on the wall, there was a small box. It looked just like the one that he'd seen in his room next to that door. If it was the same, then this door was likely locked as well. Still, he had to check. Junpei grabbed a handle and threw all of his weight onto it. It was locked as tight as the door next to it, as he suspected. Damn it! Junpei punched the door. It did not respond. <laughs> Were these the only doors, he wondered. He'd barely finished the thought when the C-deck plated past on his way up sprang unbidden to his mind. His body moved before he had time to think. Junpei turned and ran back toward the stairs. He had scarcely taken a step when, at the top of the stairs, next to an ornate clock embedded in the wall, he saw a person. It was a girl. She looked to be the same age as Junpei. He froze, unable to look away from her face. He wasn't confounded by her beauty or something equally silly. No, there was another reason he couldn't take his eyes off the girl. Junpei had seen her somewhere before. He couldn't quite remember where, but he knew. He knew he'd met her. The girl, too, stared at Junpei, similarly stunned. Her response suggested she'd seen him somewhere before as well. Without saying a word, Junpei walked slowly toward her. She didn't move. It was almost as though she had... She was held in place by some sort of magic spell. As Junpei stepped onto her landing, the spell broke. No sooner had he set his foot down than the whole ship shook a second time. Ah! The quake caught the girl unprepared, and she fell. Moving on instinct, Junpei leapt to catch her. Or so he thought. Her face was far closer than it should have been, mere inches from his own. He was flat on his back, and she had landed squarely on top of him. The girl seemed as confused as he did, and her face suggested she still hadn't fully recovered from seeing him. For a moment that seemed to stretch for a very long time, they stared at one another. The ship stopped shaking. Everything was quiet. Water could be heard from the bottom of the ship, lapping faintly at the walls and ceilings, but eventually that faded as well. The silence was complete, a thick, muffling blanket. At last, the girl opened her mouth. Oh my gosh, is that you, Jumpy? Jumpy. Jumpy. Her words echoed through Junpei's head, and suddenly his memory returned. Uh, Akane? Why hadn't he realized it before? The girl was Akane Kurashiki. She and Junpei had been friends in childhood. They'd gone to elementary school for, together for six years. But what was she doing on the ship? Her soft eyes were only inches away from his own. 
He could feel the warmth of her face. Feelings he'd lo thought long forgotten began to work their way up to the surface. He could feel his face heating up. At that moment, a speaker crackled to life, and a cold, eerie voice filled the room. Welcome aboard. I welcome you all from the bottom of my heart to this, my vessel. With the voice's invasion, the spell between Junpei and Akane was broken, and all hints of burgeoning romance instantly forgotten. They hurriedly untangled themselves from one another, and struggled to their feet. Their seven companions had heard the voices, the voices well, and many of their faces had gone pale. They looked around frantically, desperate to locate the source of the voice. At last they found it, a speaker set in the ceiling. I am Zero. The captain of this ship. I am also the person who invited you here. The voice was harsh, obscured occasionally by the crackling of static. But Junpei recognized it. How could he have forgotten it? It was the same voice he had heard from the man in the gas mask. Hey, asshole! What the hell is this? Come on out of here. I want to get a look at you. What do you mean to do to us? I mean to have you participate in a game. Some of you, I know, are familiar with this game. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. Nonary Game? What the hell's that? The voice continued, implacable. The rules of the Nonary Game can be found upon your persons. They are simple rules. Read them. Nonary Game? Hey, so there's something in my pocket. Check this out. Silver reached into his pocket and pulled out a small slip of paper. The rest of them reached into their own pockets and pulled out similar slips of paper. Junpei followed suit and dug into the pocket of his pants. He felt the telltale crumple of paper, slightly damp from his earlier ordeal. Hey, I got one too. Then it would seem Zero has seen fit to grace us each with a letter. Would you mind terribly reading it to us, young man? His request had been delivered to Junpei, who, after a short moment of surprise, did as he'd ask. On this ship, you will find a handful of doors emblazoned with numbers. We will call them the numbered doors. The doors in front of you are a pair of the, are a pair of the same. The key to opening these numbered doors are the numbered bracelets that each of you possess. Should you total the numbers on your numbered bracelets, and find that the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that door, the door will open. Only those who have opened the door wait, may pass through. There are, however, limits. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. All those who entered must leave, and all those who enter must contribute. Bracelet, Junpei figured, it had to mean the bulky thing on his wrist. He glanced around. It looked like everyone else had one as well, and had come to much the same conclusion. The purpose of the game is simple. Leave this ship alive. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Junpei had reached the end of the letter. There's a long moment of silence, and then the speaker crackled to life once more. There is one last thing I must tell you. As you have no doubt surmised, the ship has begun to sink. On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for two hours and forty minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. I will give you more time. Nine hours. That is the time you will be given to make your escape. The voice finished and the speaker went silent. The sound of a bell tolling e echoed through the hall. It came from the dance hall adjacent to the stairwell. It took those assembled on the stairs mere moments to trace the sound to an antique clock embedded on the wall. Seven. Eight. Nine. The sound of the ninth bell faded away. The tenth never came. That meant that the time was 9 o'clock, most likely 9 o'clock in the evening. When Junpei had peered out the window of his cell, he'd seen nothing but blackness. It had to be nighttime. If that was the case, then they would need to escape by 6 a.m. the following day. Now, it is time. 
Let our game begin. I wish you all the best of luck. The speaker went silent and did not speak again. Silver yelled at the speaker with language coarse enough to embarrass a sailor, but the rest of Junpei's companions were silent, deep in thought. Junpei too was consumed by his thoughts. There was a great deal he didn't understand. Who was Zero? What was the nonary game? Why had he chosen to make them a part of it? Was he a criminal who took delight in playing with his victims? Or did he have some other purpose? Why had Junpei been chosen as a part of this insane game? Why had any of them been chosen? But one question was foremost in his mind. Akane. They hadn't seen one another since elementary school. Why had she appeared now? Coincidence? No, that seemed impossible. There had to be a reason. He didn't know what it might be, but there had to be a reason. Very well. The lion's voice seemed oddly loud in the silence. Standing around here won't do us any good. Best we get moving, don't you think? Get moving? Are you planning on- are you planning to open the numbered doors? Hey, wait. Don't tell me you're actually going to do what this zero says. No, no, that's not what I mean. The lion shook his head, mildly annoyed. I'm saying, let's find another way. After all, we haven't really examined his, this place yet. We... what? Their separate investigations finished. All nine people returned to where they'd left one another. The result of all of their work was... nothing. They were completely sealed in. Their hard work had not gone completely to waste, however. They had learned a number of things as they'd scoured the parts of the ship they could reach. It seemed that they were confined to decks A through C. C deck was as far down as they would be able to go, however. The reason being... that D deck was completely submerged. Strangely, however, the water had risen no higher than D deck. The flow seemed to have been stopped somehow, as evidenced by the surface of the water on D-deck, which was smooth as glass. The prince knelt down and gently drew his hand across it. Perhaps this Zero fellow has some sort of remote control to seal a watertight door lower down. He said that our time limit was nine hours. In other words, this water won't rise for nine hours. Then you're saying we won't sink till then? Well, that may be a little bit... a little too optimistic. No point to wishful thinking. There were three metal doors on C-deck. A single door stood off to the side with two more on the wall facing the central staircase. None of them had numbers or verification devices. They were, however, locked like all the other doors. No matter how much they pushed and shoved, the doors refused to move. The mountain and the lion threw themselves against them a few times, but to no avail. The door in the back had a keyhole. Just above it was a strange mark in the shape of a circle surrounding a dot. There were two other doors on C deck as well, but it was clear there were elevators, as each had a button next to it with an upside down triangle. They tried pushing the button. No response. Apparently there was no power running to the elevators. To the left of the elevator doors was a card reader. The card reader also had a strange mark on it. It looked like a lowercase h with a dash drawn across the upper stem of the h. Junpei stared at it for a while. This is the symbol of Saturn. It's an astrological symbol. Then the mark on the other door. I think that was the sun symbol. They had seen the same symbols on Adek. There was a door on either side of the stairs. The one on the left had a keyhole with a sim similar symbol engraved on it. This is, the, this is an Earth symbol. The horizontal line symbolizes the equator, and the vertical one represents the prime meridian. Junpei looked up at the ceiling. There was a great circle cut in, in it, perhaps for a skylight or a glass dome, but it had been filled with a gargantuan metal plate. The metal looked very solid. Anything short of an explosive charge was an unlikely to damage it. There were several windows along both sides of the ship. At least there had been. They, too, were covered with metal plates. In other words,
We're trapped. All the exits go nowhere. Junpei was not happy. The girl with pink hair spoke up. Well, I'm sure they go somewhere, we just can't open them. And then the mountain spoke. You don't know that. For all we know, they just open into walls or take us into circles. The prince did not agree. No, I'm sure they go somewhere. Otherwise, what point would there be? And we can open them. Well, two of them at least. You mean the numbered doors? All eyes turned toward the doors with numbers on them. The atmosphere in the room grew tense. H hey, wait a minute. I think I said this earlier, but I don't think we should do that. The dancer moved in front of the doors as if to block them. We'd have to be crazy to open these doors. If we do that, we're doing exactly what Zero wants us to do. Suddenly, everyone began to speak at once. I agree. I don't. That's a terrible idea. We should keep going. We should stay here. We don't have any other way to open any of these doors. We should just wait. Someone's bound to come find us. We don't have time for that. In eight and a half hours, the ship is going to sink. The clamor of voices made it next to impossible to determine who was saying what. Their arguments grew more and more intense until people were shouting and screaming at one another. Junpei remained silent, but at last he could take no more. Hey! Shut up! They fell silent, and all their eyes turned to Junpei. He felt each stare burning into him, but he refused to flinch. Before we try and decide where we're going to go, there's something else we ought to do. What's that? We need to exchange information. We don't know anything about each other. I want to know who you guys are. Who you are, where you came from, why you ended up here. Don't tell me you aren't curious, too. They were silent. Some of them looked the other way, or bit their lip, or crossed their arms and stared at the ceiling. But one of them spoke up. It was Akane. I agree. I think Jumpy is right. Jumpy? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about him. I just call him Jumpy. His name is Junpei. She pointed toward, Jun pointed toward Junpei. We're childhood friends. We went to the same elementary school. Wait, stop! Don't tell us stuff we didn't ask you about. Zero's probably watching us right now. What are you gonna do if he's listening in? Would that be bad? Hell yeah, it would! We don't know how much that bastard knows about us. Maybe he just picked a bunch of random people to kidnap. If that is the case, it'd be dangerous for us to let him know too much. If Zero knows who we are, we could go af he could go after our families. Maybe he'd tell us what he had him just to get us to do stuff, you know? But we still need to know what our names are. It's going to be hard to talk to each other if we don't have names. All right, then why don't we have code names? To him, apparently, it seemed like the obvious solution. Code names? Yeah, we'll each pick something. Like, uh, I'll be seven. Seven? Why are you seven? Seemed a fair question. The mountain stuck out his left arm. Because this bracelet number says seven. Oh, I get it. Yeah, that's a good idea. He smirked. All right, then I'm going to be Santa. Any of you chumps know Japanese? Well, I mean, Akane just said our name was Junpei, so cl clearly we are Japanese. Uh, no? Well, San means three, so I'll be Santa. You know, like Santa Claus? Fits, don't you think? And then your bracelet number. Yeah, it's got, got a three on it. Good job, Grandpa. Just like the mountain had done, Silver thrust out his left hand. Sure enough, the face of the bracelet read three. Very well, then. I'll go next, shall I? My bracelet number is one. Given that, I think Ace seems appropriate. I'll be Lotus, then. As I'm sure you all know, it has eight petals. Which means, of course, that my bracelet number is... Eight. I would appreciate if you would call me Snake. My bracelet number is two. Since Ace has chosen cards, then I will choose dice. Snake eyes, clearly. Which is particularly relevant, given that I am blind. Blind? Really? He kept his eyes closed during their entire ordeal, which had suggested something strange, but to hear it said so casually, it was something of a surprise. Everyone seemed a little nervous at the prince's proclamation, but no one seemed to know how to react to it. There was one person, however, however who didn't seem to be surprised in the least. The girl with the pink hair. I want to be Clover. You know, like a four-leaf clover? Good luck, right? Looking almost bored, she held out her left hand. 
In the face of her bracelet showed the number four. They'd come around to Junpei. He held out his bracelet. I'll write my numbers five, so my code name is gonna be... Why well, have one? It's not like there's any point to it now. The dancer cut him off mid-sentence. I mean, we all know your name already. You're Junpei. Uh, oh. They all nodded. Akane stepped forward nervously. Uh, interesting thing is, uh, Uchikoshi, the creator of 999, uh, he has said that if Junpei's name wasn't revealed, then his code name would have been like Star or Hand or something like that. Uh, Akane stepped forward nervously. Then you should all call me by my name too, because, I mean, it doesn't seem... It doesn't seem fair to Jumpy. You're thinking it's not cool for you to hide your name after you told us his. Akane fidgeted awkwardly. Junbei decided he had to do something. What's your bracelet number? It's six. She hesitated for a moment, then held out her left hand. As she claimed, the bracelet's face showed a six. Junpei looked at it for a moment and thought, All right, then why don't we call you June? June? Yeah, you know, it's the sixth month of the year. So you're June. Jumpy. Akane kneaded her hands and looked up at Junpei uncertain. He smiled back at her reassuringly. Are you good with that? She thought about it for a few more minutes, then seemed to come to a decision and gave Junpei a small nod. The names decided, Junpei ran over them quickly in his head. One was Ace, two was Snake, three was Santa, four was Clover, five was Junpei's number, Akane was six and Junpei had given her the code name of June. Seven was seven, and eight was Lotus. That meant that eight of them, including Junpei, had revealed their bracelet numbers. There's still one person left. And we're going to interrogate that person about their bracelet number and code name in the next episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye